Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on growth, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. Have you ever tried to grow? I tried it once when I was a kid. It didn't work because you don't grow by trying to grow. You grow by doing something else. This brings us to an interesting topic in the experience of the Christian. Christian growth. Are we supposed to grow? What is Christian growth and how is it accomplished? Let's turn to 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 18. And here we have a familiar verse which says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, it's obvious that uh, we're supposed to grow. In fact, this sounds almost like a command. Grow in grace. The two things that are listed are growing in grace and in knowledge. So uh, let's address, first of all, the question of how do you grow in grace? Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 16, tells us something that is really of good news to the Christian. We have a friendly brother, a high priest he's called in heaven, our elder brother, the Son of God. And it says there, Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the way we uh, grow in grace is to come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's remember that grace includes two things. First of all, it includes unmerited favor. That's what we get when we receive forgiveness from God. But another meaning of grace is power, power. The grace of God is one way of saying the power of God. So learning to grow not only in receiving his forgiveness, but learning to grow in accepting his power is what happens when we come boldly to the throne of grace. And it's obvious here, the throne of grace is prayer. We often call it that. Through prayer, then, we grow in grace. But Second Peter tells us that we should also grow in knowledge, knowledge of the Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. First Peter, the second chapter, verse 2, tells us that uh, as newborn babes, we can desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And this reminds us of where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So far then, if we're going to accept the invitation to grow in grace and knowledge, we're going to come boldly to the throne of grace in prayer, and we're going to come often to God's word that we may grow. May I remind you that uh, that's the simplicity of the method or the methodology of living the Christian life. Through Bible study and prayer, that's how we grow. We don't grow by trying to grow. We grow by eating the word of God, by breathing. And someone is called prayer, the breath of the soul. Now the Bible allows for growth. Some people have missed this. There are some discouraged Christians in the world who have thought that they're supposed to be completely changed, completely different overnight. And if it didn't happen, then they became discouraged. I have known many young people who, who thought that they became Christians through some great meeting or weekend revival or series. They thought they were Christians. They had some strong feelings that they were Christians. And then the day after or the week after, they discovered that the same old problems were still there, that they hadn't changed as much as they thought they were going to change. 
when it came to performance and behavior. So they concluded that they weren't Christians. They forgot to allow for growth, which is what God himself allows for. Notice it in Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 28, Jesus talking about Christian life. He uses the illustration of the garden or the field. He says, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. If God is patient enough to let the crops grow till the time of the harvest, then we ought to be courageous and confident that he will be patient with us too as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, faith is something that we grow in too. But faith is not a uh, something that can stand all by itself. Faith itself is either all or nothing. And this gets a little complicated at first. Because uh, there are people who try to uh, make their faith grow, thinking that the quality of faith can change. Uh, trust in someone or trust in something else is either all or nothing. Either you put your full weight down in the airplane or you don't go at all. I suppose you've heard of people who are frightened about flying. And so they say they got on the airplane, but they never did let their full weight down all the way to Chicago. That's impossible. And it's just as impossible to have partial faith. You either have entire faith or you don't have any faith. Remember, the disciples came to Jesus one time and they said, Lord, increase our faith. And he said, essentially, increase your faith. Why, if you have the amount of a grain of mustard seed, that's enough. That's enough. That'll do it. So uh, the real thing he pointed out there was, was not that you need more faith. It is that you better be sure you have the right thing. If you have the right thing, the genuine faith, then it's going to be all you need, even though it's ever so small, apparently. Well, then, uh, how could you grow in faith? Because the Bible does talk about growing in faith, too. It would have to be growing in the constancy of faith. Not the quality of faith, but the quantity, should we say, or the constancy of faith. You see, once we become Christians, we do not depend upon Jesus every moment of every day. And that's why we often fall and fail as newborn Christians and even as growing, struggling Christians. For years, we discover that it's still possible to fall and fail and sin. And we often have to come and plead for God to forgive us. But he's anxious to forgive us. He tells us that uh, there's provision to not sin, but if we do sin, there's an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But in the growing Christian life, we will sometimes, in the course of a day, depend upon God. Sometimes we will depend on ourselves. Even if we have time in the Bible and in prayer and have a meaningful devotional life and a connection with heaven, we can still experience that same day depending part of the time on God and depending part of the time on ourselves. So, uh, during the time we're depending on God, we have all faith. But when we depend on ourselves, we have no faith. It's either all or nothing. There's no such thing as depending partly on God and partly on ourselves at any given moment. There is such a thing as depending part of the time on God and part of the time on ourselves. So the growth in the Christian life would be in letting God lead us to depend more and more constantly on Him so that the experience of faith or total dependence upon God will be more and more constant until it is permanent and nothing will allow us or permit us or cause us 
to separate from that dependence upon his strength or his power. I'd like to try and draw a little uh, diagram up here on an imaginary uh, board, if you please. Let's just have this uh, diagram representing a seismograph. Here we have a base to this meter and a curved part to the meter with a point in the middle down here on the base and a needle that can uh, go up or down on the meter. This device is a seismograph for measuring your sins. A sin seismograph. So every time you lose your temper, before you become a Christian, the needle on the seismograph pins on number 10. And uh, this particular seismograph has numbers from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. But then you become a Christian. And whenever you lose your temper, you're not quite as strong as before you became a Christian, according to some people's idea. And the needle only goes up to number 9. It doesn't pin at 10. And some people think that with this kind of seismograph, you keep on trying hard to be a Christian. And uh, if you try hard enough and make enough New Year's resolutions, that the day will come when uh, your temper will only put the needle up to five when you lose your temper. And this growth, so-called growth, will continue until just before you die. Maybe you'll get in one good day. And the needle won't even flutter. Is this true or false? This is the way I think many Christians understand it. But I'd like to do away with this sin seismograph. Just uh, tear it up and do away with it. And we start over again. This time we have a sin seismograph that looks like the other one. The base and the needle and the curved part with only 0 and 10. No such thing as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, and 10. Now, before we're Christian and we are tempted to lose our temper, we do. And the needle gets pinned at number 10 every time. But after we become Christians and we discover or begin to discover what it means to depend upon God's power instead of our own, then, whenever we are tempted to lose our temper, if at that moment we are depending upon God instead of ourselves, the needle on the sin seismograph doesn't even flutter. But if at any time in the Christian life we look away from Jesus and depend on ourselves, the needle pins at 10. It makes no difference whether I've been a Christian for 15 minutes or for 40 years. Do you see the difference? Either we have total faith and God gives us the victory and the needle doesn't even move, or we have no faith at that moment and we depend on ourselves, we fall and fail and sin and the needle gets pinned every time. Then the growth as far as this seismograph is concerned, would be in learning to let God lead us to where we depend upon him more and more constantly and experience zero on the meter more and more. There's a good example from the days of the Bible. Moses. Moses was a young man who had just graduated from military school in Upper Egypt. And um, God said to Moses, I want you to lead Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said, well, I think you've picked the right man. I have just graduated from military school. And he began to get started delivering Israel from Egypt. He got one Egyptian and ended up running across the desert to get lost from King Pharaoh. Forty more years went by, and Moses was a sheep herder. At the end of 40 years, God said, Moses, I want you to lead Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said, no, not me. You got the wrong man. I am a born sheep herder. I can't do it. At that point, God must have smiled because he knew that Moses had learned the lesson. 
of depending upon God instead of on himself, and he was now ready to do his big work. And there was a mighty deliverance from Egypt. But 40 more years went by, and at the end of that 40 years, it looked like the people were going to lose faith and heart and go back into the wilderness again. And Moses turned away from God for a moment, dependent upon himself, lost his temper and began beating on a rock out there in the wilderness with a stick. Some people say, well, he, he's made a lot of progress. He's beating on rocks instead of Egyptians now. But that's not the point. He was still able to pin the needle at 10, even though he had been a Christian for almost 120 years, which shows that it makes no difference whether you've been a Christian for just a short while or for a lifetime. At any time you depend on yourself, you always fall and fail and sin. But at any time you depend upon God for strength, he will give you the victory. And the growth, therefore, is in learning to depend more and more constantly upon God for strength. Well, uh, someone might say, uh, you mean that I'm supposed to begin working on depending on God? No, no, no. That's his department. All we can do is make use of the means by which growth takes place. Read the Bible. That's eating. Prayer. That's breathing. And exercise. Exercise. We notice this is a Christian witness. Service for God. Working with him. These are the elements by which growth takes place. We never work on growing. We don't work on trying to depend upon God more. We simply place our attention upon Jesus, the source of our strength. And he accomplishes the growth in our life. And he has some strange ways of doing it. Strange indeed. He is not in the business of making us stronger and stronger. He's not trying to help us grow strong. He's really in the business of showing us how weak we are. And this comes as a real problem to strong people. It doesn't make sense to them. First Corinthians, the first chapter, tells us that the wisdom of God is foolishness with man. And there are many high achievers and strong people who have nothing of it. They're not interested in a religion that teaches that we can do nothing. But Jesus said it long ago in John 15. He said, without me, ye can do nothing. Well, that doesn't mean that without him, we're worth nothing. We're worth everything, even without him. That's why he came to this world, to save us, because we're worth everything. But we are helpless still to produce righteousness, helpless to grow, helpless to become strong. It has to be his work and his power in our life, and we learn to depend upon him by realizing how weak we really are. That's why Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. It's the little child that looks for power from above him, and that's another reason why Jesus said, unless you are converted and become as little children, you won't see the kingdom of God. There was a mighty man in the New Testament days. You remember him. His name had been Saul. He was a persecutor. And he was out with great zeal to persecute the Christians in the early church. And as he did, one day, a wonderful thing happened to him. He didn't think so at the time. He fell on his face on the road to Damascus to kill more Christians. And there on his face, he looked up at a bright light, so bright that he became blinded. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He was meeting the Lord for the first time. And the voice said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. 
there was a great change in Saul's life. He asked the Lord what he wanted him to do. And the Lord told him what to do. And he obeyed. And he became a Christian. One of the mightiest Christians who ever lived. Someone has said concerning the Apostle Paul that he was the greatest Christian that ever lived. There was no second. And the third was 10,000 miles behind him. But he was a strong man. He had a strong will. If there was ever one that was ever stubborn, it would be the Apostle Paul, as he became known, the Apostle to the Gentiles. But as a result of his experience on the road to Damascus, he became hard of sight. He couldn't see well. He had a problem. And apparently it was so bad that he pleaded with God to take it away. Three times he had special intercession with God to help him with this problem. He called it a thorn in the flesh. He was handicapped with his poor vision after that big vision on the road to Damascus. The light had blinded him, and God saw fit to leave his eyes that way, just like he saw fit to leave Jacob crippled after his name was changed to Israel in the night of wrestling. Well, finally, at the end of Paul's pleading with God, God essentially told him to pray no more. And the reason? Because he knew that Paul's strength would be made perfect in weakness. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 9 and 10. So Paul accepted that. And he said, I will gladly suffer my infirmities, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He discovered that when he was weak, then he was strong. That's a strange way. That's a strange way for God to work. But like Watchman Nee, the great Chinese Christian, wrote in his book, The Normal Christian Life, God is not in the business of making us stronger and stronger. He's in the business of making us weaker and weaker. Oh, you say, that's a strange way for God to work. Yes, but it is his way. And some of the greatest things that were accomplished by godly people of old were accomplished when they realized how weak they really were. Gideon. You remember Gideon. He was going to go and conquer the enemy the Midianites. And so he took a huge army, over 20,000 soldiers. God said that's too many. And he gave a little test by which Gideon could find out who were really with him in this warfare. And then another test. He continued until there were only 300 soldiers left to conquer a mighty army of thousands and thousands. What was God doing? He was showing Gideon that his strength and his victory would come from realizing how weak they really were. For in weakness, we realize our strength. God did this again and again in a number of different occasions. Just to make it clear that when a mighty victory had been won for his cause and for his kingdom, that it wasn't the human arm or human might that had brought the victory. Remember Jehoshaphat's battle in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, where uh, Jehoshaphat was told to send out the choir to meet the enemy. Send out the choir? That's about as weak as you can get, meeting the enemy on the battlefront with the choir. But he did. He followed God's directions. And God had a mighty victory that day. And there was a group of people who knew for sure they weren't responsible. It was the choir. All they did was sing. And when they sang praises to God, the Lord lifted up a standard against the enemy. So as we consider growth, let's remember the simple formula for uh, living the Christian life. John 15, verse 5. 
Without me, ye can do how much? Nothing. But Philippians 4.13, the other text, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in every age, it is a timeless principle that out of weakness, we are made strong. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we are thankful when you show us our weakness. At first, it doesn't make sense. But as we look into your word, we discover the mighty things that were done by people who realized their weakness and were willing to admit it. Please come in with your might, we pray, and help us to remember that all power is in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now. <laughs>